Okay, great. So welcome to everyone. I'm getting used to that. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, another very interesting uh, mini course today, this time from Los Alamos. Our guests uh, woke up very early to be able to be there for us. So thank you very much, Nathan and Julie. So here we have again the pleasure to have Kevin Brosnan from the U.S. Consulate of Rio de Janeiro to welcome our um, guests. And uh, we also have the pleasure to have Guilherme Travels from the uh, UFRJ COVID team that also is here with us. So please, Kevin, the is to you. Good morning. Thank you, Stefanella. My name is Kevin Brosnahan. I'm the Cultural Affairs Officer here at the U.S. Consulate General in, in Rio de Janeiro. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to welcome two American experts participating in today's event. I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Stefanella uh, uh, Boato and uh, UFR Jota for this um, scientific collaboration of sharing information and sharing experiences. Uh, scientific collaboration is an important priority for the U.S. diplomatic mission here in Brazil. Uh, we have the embassy in Brasilia as well as consulates across the country. This type of collaboration and sharing of experiences benefits both the United States and Brazil. And obviously Brazilian scientists have a lot to contribute to this conversation as well. The United States Network of National Laboratories is a national scientific treasure, serving as epicenters of research and innovation the scientific innovations help guide public policy, protect public health, and drive innovations for the private sector. We're extremely proud of our uh, national laboratories, including Los Alamos National Laboratory, and our scientists that work at those national laboratories. Two years ago, the U.S. Consulate, along with UFR Jota, sponsored the first meeting of Fluminense Women in Biomath. I think the name is better in Portuguese. O primeiro encontro fluminense de mulheres em matemática. For that event, we were able to bring and host and uh, uh, sponsor the participation of a number of um, U.S. women scientists working in biomath and epidemiology, including Caitlin Martinez. So obviously, that was just the beginning of a stronger uh, scientific relationship and cooperation between um, mathematicians, scientists, and researchers in the United States and Brazil. It's my pleasure to welcome both Caitlin Martinez and Julie Spencer virtually to Rio de Janeiro this morning. Um, and this type of event extends our scientific cooperation that started, really didn't just start two years ago, but had gives us another chapter in this um, cooperation. So thank you for being here. I hope this um, exchange of ideas and exchange of information and experience uh, creates new opportunities for us to collaborate in the future. I wish everybody a successful event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. So now it's Guilherme, our task for COVID team. Please, okay. Guilherme Travis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefanella. Congrats for the organization of these uh, sort of uh, conferences and mini course. It's quite important for us. And thank you so much, uh, uh, Julie, Kathleen, and Kevin for being here and then opening these things. And mainly for Julie and Kathleen that are going to work a little bit more than us this morning. Um, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. It's really an honor for me to, to be talking to all of you. And uh, it's quite nice to, to present a little bit of the effort that the, our university is performing against the new coronavirus or new COVID, uh, new virus or uh, this sort of a really bad thing that is surrounding us for, uh, for a while. And uh, we've been working a lot in a sort of a multidisciplinary task force. Professor uh, Boato uh, Stefanella is part of this, this group too, working with the modeling. We've, we have different activities and it's, it's been producing a, a huge, how to say, transformation of our ecosystem. Uh, we are starting to work uh, pretty much uh, collaborative and uh, with a uh, a strong cooperation among the different institutes and departments, what is quite nice, and it has strength, the power of uh, the university to deal with all of these things, uh, including different partners like the U.S. Uh, researchers and then other partners from Europe. Uh, so we have uh, 
uh, organized uh, different activities and projects. And uh, we are now working in big projects that are being granted by the country and the state that are combining the different uh, uh, groups and also countries around the, the COVID and a, a solution or possible solutions to support uh, the fight against this, this disease. So it, it's quite nice for me uh, to be here to announce that. Uh, the talk that we are gonna have, it, it's really uh, amazing and it's really exciting, in, in, at least for me, the, the idea of data fusion and all these things of thing. I, 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 I believe that uh, it's a, a great opportunity to, to start a more, how to say, um, uh, strong conversation with Los Alamos to establish a more how in deep cooperation. We, we have a lot of the good things to do together, I, I believe. And then Stefanella is, is the leader of the, the discussion, so she can manage all these things. Okay, Stefanella, and bring and bring this to us. So we have, besides the university and the task force, we have also the Hub Hill, that's a strong organization of researchers and uh, research institutions. That uh, the Mathematics Institute is is, a, is an important part of that too, like other other parts of the university. So uh, I, I see it as a really new opportunity. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, uh, Julie and Kathleen, for being here. It's my pleasure. Welcome to the, our university, even that virtually. But I hope that uh, soon we can give, uh, we can have all of us together again, you know, to celebrate life and then celebrate science. Have a, a really nice uh, course and, and, and work time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guilherme, for this great opening. And now we have a few words from Maria Fernanda Elber, that is the vice head of our uh, PhD program in the math department, in Ma math institute, I'm sorry. Good and morning. Fernanda? Good morning, are you hearing me? Hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Oh. We oh, cannot I... see you, but we can hear you. Hello, you can't <laughs> can see me. No. So <laughs> oh, the future. Okay. Oh, now, okay. Now, yes, yes, yeah. great. I'm sorry I have had technical problems with the other computer I had to change. And my name is Alberto, it's my husband's name, sorry. <laughs> it was, I'm uh, here in the name of the Mass Graduate Programs of UFAJ to welcome Julie Spencer and Kathleen Martinez from Los Alamos National Laboratory. Good morning, Julie and Kathleen. I'm very happy to have you with, with us today and to hear about your research. In fact, Ka uh, Kathleen, welcome back to FRJ. We know that you have already been here at 2018. And I hope to see you both in person at FRJ in a nearby future. And in the name of, the, of, our, of our research group, I would like to say that we hope that this is the beginning of a future research collaboration. Uh, thanks, Stefanella, for the organization of these talks. And thank you very much, Julie and Kathleen, and go ahead. Thank you, Maria Fernanda. Very good that you fight all this <laughs> trouble. <laughs> yeah. So now back to Kathleen and Julie. Who will go first? Julie. Julie. Okay. Julie, go ahead, please. Hi, good morning. Uh, so I guess I need to share my screen, huh? Yeah. Um, okay. It's all a learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you okay. want to full screen. Yeah, <laughs> I need to start the slideshow. Yeah, should be there. Should be that. And um, let's see. Should be the one on the left. Yeah. Yay. Is that, wait, now I need to start. Presentation, the presentation, the third one, the third, oh, okay, whatever. Okay, does that work? Yes. Uh, so good morning, welcome to our mini course. Um, I'm going first because I'm the one who's a morning person. <laughs> but um, 
Today we're going to talk about, uh, th anyway, thank you so much for inviting us. This is just a wonderful opportunity. And, you know, um, COVID-19 has been just a terrible thing worldwide, but a uh, silver lining is that there have been unprecedented international scientific collaborations. And when we defeat the virus, I hope we can keep those collaborations <laughs> going forward. Um, sorry. <laughs> So uh, today we're going to do a little mini course on mitigation and data fusion approaches to understanding infectious diseases. And so I'm going to do the mitigation part. And in the forest of epidemiology, I'm going to look at one tree. I'm going to back way up and I'm actually going to go through for you how to construct an SIR model, even if you have never done it before. So we're going to do basic building blocks. And then when it comes to Dr. Martinez, um, then <laughs> instead of looking at the one tree, we're going to zoom out and we're going to look at the whole forest. Um, because uh, Dr. Martinez will be talking about data fusion and um, go way more complex. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say that um, this is part of our epidemiology team at Los Alamos National Lab in Group A1. And everything we do, we do in collaboration. And it's our work is so much more exciting because we're not doing it alone in an ivory tower. <laughs> and you'll see this picture again. <laughs> um, so we're doing mitigation modeling for COVID-19. And I'm sure you all are all aware, uh, it spilled over as a novel zoonosis from animals in late 2019 and was declared a pandemic worldwide by the World Health Organization on March the 11th. And an update of, as of this morning, we have had over 30 million cases worldwide and 945,000 deaths. So it's ongoing, it's real, it's serious. And uh, what can we do about this? So there are many different approaches to fighting this disease, um, but one thing we can do is mitigation modeling. Uh, I just wanted to define mitigation modeling a little bit um, and to say that there are many forecasting efforts to try to predict how many cases and deaths and how many hospitalizations and things like that. Um, but the type of simple deterministic compartmental model that I'm working with and that we are working with um, is not primarily for forecasting what will happen in the future. It is primarily to get understanding and insight into dynamics so that we can prioritize resources and figure out what to do. <laughs> so that's the purpose. Um, and simple models can actually be very powerful, um, like the one we're going to build from the ground up today. Um, and there are certain questions that are actually answered better by simple models because it's really good to reduce the number of parameters if possible. Um, but there are other questions like in the uh, mini course on Tuesday, which are more complex and actually need more complex models. So our goal today is to be able for you to actually construct and code your own SIR model. And my apologies if uh, some of you are already know how to do this a long time ago, but um, I thought it would be good to, to start with the basics. Um, and I, I personally find this modeling very fun. It's, it's like playing, it's very experimental. And once you get the model on your computer in R, you can just change so many things and see what happens with the epidemic and you can do experiments in silico on your computer. So here's a quick outline of um, what we're going to do. We're going to make a flow chart to model the disease. We're going to write equations. We're going to go through the parameters. There's only two. Um, we are going to do some simulations and we're going to look at the outcomes. So it's a crash course <laughs> in deterministic SIR modeling with ordinary differential equations. So let's um, 
I want to give credit to my two favorite textbooks. <laughs> um, so this is just a very brief introduction, but um, a lot of the things that I've learned about modeling have come from these two books. And also I wanted to encourage you, please take screenshots whenever you wanna take screenshots. Um, I think this is being recorded as well, but um, these books are amazing. They're, it's applied mathematics. <laughs> um, and you can learn a lot from them. And I take zero credit for anything in this course because they all come out of these books. Okay, so um, let's start out with a simple SIR model. So S stands for susceptible. And these are the people in a population that we're modeling who are capable of catching the disease that we're modeling. And um, so for a novel, coronavirus, which human beings have never been exposed to before and have, um, as far as we know, no background immunity, although there are some studies about that, um, we can assume that the entire human population is actually susceptible, except for the people who have already had it. And then <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a virologist, so I'm not gonna even get into immunity and stuff like that. But um, so, in what we're doing is we're, we are in a very abstract and simplified way, we are looking at the flow of the population from being susceptible to catching the disease and then in the eye compartment, that's the infectious compartment, to catching the disease and being able to tr transmit it to other people. And then the R compartment stands for recovered, having recovered from the disease. And so this is super simplified. And a lot of times people in will include an E compartment between the S and the I um, to symbolize that someone has been exposed but is not yet infectious. And this captures what is called the latent period, which um, is kind of similar to the incubation period, but not quite the same thing. So here we're just like glossing over that. We're saying first we're susceptible, then we become infectious, and then we're recovered. And sometimes people will draw, draw like a little dotted line from the infectious to the arrow between the S and the I to show that the people who are infectious are making contact with the people who are susceptible. And so I just wanted to mention two things because there are many different types of mathematical models um, for getting insight into disease. And this, uh, one of the main assumptions um, in the simple SIR model is that we have a closed population. So we're not, we're not including births and deaths. And actually, it is a fairly good approximation for the dynamics of what's going on if you have a large population that is fairly well mixed. And so another thing to mention um, is the homogeneous mixing. We're not looking at spatial structure, um, which is a simplification and it's an assumption. But it turns out that for a... Um, for a disease that is transmitted by aerosol, it's also a fairly good approximation in some cases because it spreads so quickly. And it's, um, anyway, so we're starting simple. And so now we can go to the differential equations that describe the changes in these compartments. Um, so, I'm going to lead you through this. And once again, apologies if this is, you already know this, but so the DSDT stands for the change in the compartment S in the susceptible compartment. And what we're saying that there's a transmission rate beta, which is actually composed of the, prob the independent probabilities of a susceptible person contacting an infectious person and then that is multiplied by the probability of um, a transmission event taking place. So there's also an assumption that those two events are independent. Um, so that's what beta is. And then we, because we want per capita change, we multiply that times the susceptible population and the infectious population because we're capturing the contact between the two populations. 
And so when you go from S to I at rate beta, which is the basic transmission rate, then we come to the change in the compartment I, which is, um, so the people coming into that compartment are the basic transmission rate beta times S times the population I, and then the people going out, so we need a minus sign because they're being removed from that compartment. They're going out at the recovery rate gamma times the population uh, I, the infectious people. And so it's very simple. We just have two rates. We have a transmission rate and a recovery rate. Um, and we're showing what is happening. And then um, for the recovery rate, the people recovering are recovering at rate gamma and they're coming from a compartment infectious. And so sorry if that was a little too obsessive and detailed, but um, sometimes, you know, even mathematicians, when they see equations, they're like, oh no, an equation. And really it's, um, equations are beautiful, beautiful abstract ways to describe what's going on in real life. And so that's why I wanted to show these and then um, something that's very important to check, even when you're making more complex models, is that the number of equations always is the same as the number of, mo of compartments, because the whole point is to show the change in each compartment and in the whole system, because the system is related. Um, and then to check to see if you haven't made a typo or copied something wrong in, in your equation, you always need to check to, to make sure all the terms add up to zero. So we can do that right now. So minus beta SI cancels out with beta SI, and then minus gamma I cancels out with gamma I, sorry, did I say minus gamma I cancels with gamma I. So you can see they add up to zero. So that means the system is consistent. And so we're good, we can go. So let's go to the next. Um, uh, Stefanella, how much time do I have left? Because I'm not sure of the timing. Well, each part could be like uh, 50 minutes. So you'll still have 40 minutes. So go ahead. Okay, okay. So I want to allow plenty of time for questions. And so actually, um, I forgot to say that, but um, please feel free to, like, we don't have to wait till the end for questions. Um, so please feel free to ask questions. Um, right now, if you want to. Um, and sh where should I look for the questions? Or like, will people turn on their microphones or? Um... We'll we keep, we keep uh, track of the chat, don't worry. Okay, yes, okay, so you'll, you'll tell me. Yes. Um, okay, yeah, so please, um, please feel free to ask questions. And I, um, I um, feel very strongly that questions are very, very, very important because, um, and you know, you have to be brave to ask a question, especially when you're learning something and especially when you're a beginner, because when you ask, you are admitting to all the people in the world that you don't know that thing. <laughs> um, so I consider myself kind of a professional question asker. And I just, I, it's like a martial art, you know, you practice, you are afraid, you step on the mat, you show up, you ask your question, you tell the whole world, I don't know this thing. But in that moment, you open up the possibility of learning, <laughs> and which is a lifelong process. So there's my little um, soapbox spiel about questions. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're gonna go on to the basic re reproductive number, which for the COVID-19 epidemic has been in the news a lot. <laughs> so everyone that has heard of r not now, or some people call it R0 or r not, or the basic reproduction number, or the basic reproductive ratio. There's a lot of different names, but it's all the same thing. And so the, the definition of this is if one infectious person is uh, walks into a population um, of susceptible people, how many people will that infectious person infect? And then, you know, everything we do is in terms of per time unit. So usually we talk about per days, but you can use other time units. Um, so for example, like different diseases have really different r nots. And measles, <laughs> I don't know, it's like 12 or 13 or 14 or something. It's uh, estimates vary. But um, so 
from the system of equations that we have just built, we can get an expression for R naught. And this sentence that is at the top of the slide is straight out of the Keeling and Rouhani textbook. So if you, um, the average infectious period is given by one over gamma. And I just want to stop there and see if anyone has any questions about that and say, okay, so like uh, how we get that one over gamma um, is that if gamma is the recovery rate from infectious period, the time period that people spend in the infectious compartment is going to be one over gamma. And so an analogy might be like, um, if you live to be 100 years old, um, the rate that you go through that, those 100 years is one over 100 per year. Um, and so that's how the rate that you pass through the compartment is related to the um, time period of the compartment. So I just wanted to be very explicit about everything. Um, and does anyone have any questions about that? Um, okay, so anyway, if the average infectious period is given by one over gamma, um, and actually we can go back and see, yes, gamma is the recovery rate, and one over gamma is the time we spend in the compartment I, um, and the transmission rate is beta that we already talked about, then the basic reproductive ratio or not is determined by beta over gamma. Um, and so I just wanted to put a caveat here that if you have a more complex model, R naught is going to look different. This is not the formula for R naught for every system. <laughs> it's, um, and it can get quite complex actually. So um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the next generation method. And so there are ways to, um, derive or not for any system. So um, I think I just also wanted to briefly mention that important result from the famous uh, 1927 paper um, by, oh my gosh, my mind is going blank. Someone tell me. Um, Kendrick. Yes, okay. Um, so, um, Karamak and McKendrick derived the famous result about R0 that um, there's a threshold. So when R0 equals one, um, nothing is changing. When R0 is less than one, the disease will die out in the population. And when R0 is greater than one, um, the disease will take off. So that's uh, something that people refer to a lot. and. Um, so obviously with our interventions and our mitigations to COVID-19, we can actually reduce the R0 and the goal is that this disease will not spread anymore. Um, so <laughs> a whole page of code, yay. <laughs> so um, what I wanted to do um, for those of you who are used to using R and have used R in the past, um, if you already know how to build these models, you probably don't need this, but if you have never used R before or never built an SIR model before, take a screenshot because uh, I tested this code and I'm 95% sure um, if you first, okay, so I'm gonna stop and give you instructions. If you download R um, and you can just Google R and you can download it, um, then you, after that, you download R Studio. Okay, <laughs> and then after you download our studio, um, what you need is one package, you need dsolve. And that's the only other package you need. Um, and then if you literally copy and paste this code into your R Studio window um, and you press, um, I forget what button you press, but you press go. <laughs> um, actually, you can just highlight the code and press return. Um, then um, what you should get, because we have, uh, we have the, the SIR model being implemented here and we have plotting, um, you should actually get an epidemic curve that shows what the maybe, susceptible. Maybe you can send us this code, it would be even easier. I can put in the Google Classroom out there. Um, so I, I had to use a different computer today, so I don't have it on this computer, but- uh, No, no, it? now. Yes, later. later yes. Okay, yes, uh, yes, I will send it to you. Okay, so um, thank you. And so let's go through it really fast. And I, I made different colors, so it's not just like this page of code. Um, 
so first we do require desolve. I'm not going to go through every line, but I'll go through like what the sections are for. So um, require desolve means that we're going to use the um, the default um, differential equation system solver in R. We set up a time vector. So we're going to say uh, we're going to run this model for 100 days, uh, one day at a time. Um, we set the parameter values. We only have two parameters, beta and gamma. Um, 0 0.001 is kind of a standard default beta value for toy models. Um, and, you know, when I say toy model, I don't mean that it's for like five year olds. <laughs> I mean that it's a beautiful, simple thing where we can really understand what we're doing and then we can get more complex from there. Um, but this has to work first. <laughs> so, um, and then gamma, we're, we're setting the recovery rate at one over five days because um, that's what I like to start with because uh, in general for any kind of influenza like illness, um, that's, uh, well, I did like this historic parameter review for um, a, a wide variety of influenza-like illnesses, and that seems to be like the mean um, infectious period for a lot of them. So then um, we're gonna make a vector of the inputted parameter values. We're gonna set the initial values. And so I just wanted to remind you that we're doing um, a deterministic model, which means if we, for a set of, initial conditions and a set of definite parameters, we're going to come out with the same result every time. And so you can actually add a stochastic element to this, which is really exciting and which we don't have time for today. So um, in the green, we're going to set up a function that evaluates the model. And sorry, I said S-E-I-R, but it's actually S-I-R. Um, and this one line that says S-I-R, with the little sideways carrot and the hyphen, that defines the function. And it says, we are going to use the time vector that we've set up. We are going to um, assign, I forget actually, well, anyway, uh, this is how we set it up. We set up for X and the parameters, and then we extract the state var variables. And this extracting the state variables is really, um, I don't know if it's strictly necessary, but it just sets it up so that our code is more generalizable and we can use it for more things later. So then um, at the top of the second column, we evaluate the ordinary differential equations. And these are actually the same equations that we just wrote. Um, they're just in our code. Um, so they're just written slightly differently, but they're exactly the same thing. And then we combine those into a single vector. Uh, we turn it as a list. And then in the yellow, um, this is where we solve the whole system. And we don't have to solve <laughs> the system of differential equations manually, <laughs> which is, it turns out, pretty difficult sometimes. Um, we let the computer do all the work for us. Um, and then in the blue is the plotting uh, code, and I won't go into that in detail. It just, um, that's what plots the epidemic curves that we're going to look at in a few minutes. So, um, or actually, we're going to look at them right now. So when we run this code with those um, initial conditions and those parameters that we told it to do, um, our baseline scenario, and we'll just go through this in a little bit of detail. So, S in blue, and I'm, I really apologize, I didn't make these uh, colorblind friendly colors, but I think we can still follow it. So S on the top of the key in blue is a susceptible population. And you can see as the epidemic moves through the population on the X axis, we have 60 days. Uh, on the Y axis, we have, um, I just set an arbitrary population of 10,000 people like for a small town. Um, for the purpose of this toy model simulation. And then um, you can see as people catch the disease and the disease moves through the population and each day goes on, the number of susceptible um, people is decreasing um, because as people catch it, they become infected and they are not susceptible anymore. So they're going from the S to the I. And then in the, the next one down, I in the key, you can see this is the epidemic curve. This is um, a really classic epidemic curve where it goes up ex exponentially, it hits a peak, 
and then it starts declining. And then the next one in the key is R, the recovered in green. And then as people have caught the infection and then they are recovering at rate gamma, um, they're going from the I compartment into the R compartment. We can see that more and more and more people recover um, until in this simple example, the entire population has recovered. So, um, so now, <laughs> Finally, we get to the punchline. We are going to do some mitigations. And so I wanted to mention that there are many, many types of mitigations that we can apply in these models. And that's one thing that makes it so creative and so fun. Um, we can look at what if we had a vaccination? What would that do? Um, we can look at what if we were uh, wonderful at social distancing and washing our hands? So that's, that's what we're going to look at right now. Um, so one very simple way to apply a mitigation is to say that we are going to reduce the transmission rate. And so in this second um, plot where it says transmission reduced by 10%, um, what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, everyone is washing their hands. <laughs> um, and we might still be seeing each other. We might, um, we might think, oh, this, you know, I'm, I'm talking about kind of like back in February and April <laughs> when uh, we're reading in the news, um, there seems to be a pretty bad flu-like virus that's spreading. We're not sure how bad it is. Maybe we should start washing our hands more. And so we're not doing very aggressive uh, hygiene and social distancing, but we are being more careful. Um, and so what I'm saying arbitrarily, I am saying that reduces transmission by 10%. And how we would implement this in the equations and the code I want to go back to show you exactly how we would do this so that it's not a mystery, um, is we would introduce a term like alpha and say alpha is going to reduce beta by a certain amount. And so right next to beta, we would put an alpha and we would set it equal to 0 0.9 if we want to reduce beta by 10%. Um, and so then in the code, what we would do where it says evaluate the differential equations, we put the beta right in there and we actually add, or sorry, we put the alpha right in there that is our um, transmission reduction coefficient. And then we add it to our parameters and we set it equal to whatever we want, um, the amount that we need to reduce beta. And so I just wanted to be very explicit about that. Sorry. Okay. So, um, in the next, I'm going to have to minimize the thumbnails so I can see this. Okay, so in the next um, plot, what we're going to do is we're going to say we have closed a lot of non-essential businesses. Um, people are mostly staying home. We're actually wearing masks <laughs> when we talk to each other. We're staying six feet apart. Um, and we're assuming that... So a lot of people are doing this very effectively. It's not really perfect. Um, and so we're just going to arbitrarily say for our toy model that transmission is reduced by 50%. And so what happens then to implement it, we say that alpha equals 0 0.5. That's multiplied by beta, our transmission rate. Our transmission is reduced. Um, and you can see the dramatic effect this has on the projected epidemic. Um, the infected line, um, the curve, the epidemic curve is um, reduced considerably. The peak is much lower. And something else I want you to notice is that the peak is considerably delayed. Um, and just by looking at this, we can see like it's delayed by about three weeks. And so by delaying the peak, that's a really important epidemiological goal because we can spread out the number of cases, not overwhelm the hospitals, make sure there are enough hospital beds and enough ventilators um, and things like that. And then you can see that the um, susceptible and recovered curves are analogously delayed. Um, so there, <laughs> we have constructed an SIR model. We have written the equations. We have implemented a mitigation 
to actually see what would what would happen and we have looked at the outcomes we looked at, we've looked at how it affects the epidemic curve and so um many of you in the audience will have done this a lot but some of you may have not uh, actually constructed a model from nothing uh and now we're doing mathematical modeling and uh, we can see that this can make a difference this is important work and it can make a difference and um some of the uh, added refinements that we can do there are just so many things we can do we can add age structure which is important for COVID-19 uh, we could add comorbidity structure which also could be very important for COVID-19 and um, we could actually add uh, spatial heterogeneity um, which so we and on and on and on we can just add um, customize our model for the questions that we are asking let's see so uh speaking of questions um one important purpose of these models is to prioritize uh so if we're given limited resources and i mean do we ever have unlimited resources not really um so we can we can assume that we have limited resources um we want to fight this pandemic we cannot do everything so we need insight into questions like is testing more of a priority or is social distancing more of a priority they both have costs they both have trade-offs social distancing has a huge economic cost testing is expensive which one is more important since we can't do all of them all the time um when it comes to testing how important is the speed uh, that you get your results back. Um, and how does that enter into the nonlinear dynamics of this system of ordinary differential equations? Um, what about accuracy, false negatives, false positives? How does that play into it? And like, if we can't close everything and we had to choose between closing businesses or schools, which one would be more important? Uh, and then in the future, if we do have a working vaccine, how do we implement that? What are the priorities? Uh, how do we optimize the effectiveness of the vaccine? And we, we can ask many, many more questions. And so I'd like you to think about what your questions are and how you would like to model them. And sorry, okay, so that's everything I have. And now we have time for questions and answers and to have a little discussion about this. And um, Caitlin, Dr. Caitlin Martinez is going to be next. Um, and this has been just focusing on a very, 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 very uh, basic and very small part of epidemiology. And um, Dr. Martinez next will um, zoom out and broaden the scope considerably. And so I'm hoping you have some questions. Thank you, Julie. That was great. I think uh, that, as you said, there are many people, some of us work on this, but there are some people that are from different areas. They just heard on the news and they were for sure very happy to see the construction of, of this, this famous, you know, R0, the model. Uh, thank you very much. So I, I think that maybe we can leave the question when we come back and we can do like 10 minutes if you if you agree so oh, i do see a question in the uh, youtube chat oh okay um, talking okay. about whether or not um a system of ODEs is a lumped parameter approximation to d a distributed process and whether you could do a broader simulation of a distributed process or some stochastic kind of thing or something that's more you know um, like an agent based model, I kind of think of it like that to find the parameters for this more simplified version or more um, not simplified, but the, the lumped model, Julie. So my short answer is yes. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know, I actually might defer that question to you, Dr. Martinez, because you're much more of a mathematician than I am. <laughs> yeah, so Julie's background, so part of the background on how we know each other, she's actually a biologist by training um, <laughs> and has come into the math biology world with a host of knowledge on all sorts of bio questions. So we go to her for bio and we just, that's part of the sharing of knowledge in the applied math world. So 
um, to address this question, she's completely right. Yes, you can do these um, kind of more of a distributed process, an agent-based model, something that's more um, uh, detailed to try to find out what these parameters are, you know, so you're, you, you do that. Um, and then you can pipe those into a bigger simulation, an ODE simulation, a stochastic ODE simulation, you can do all, lots of sorts of things there. I think one of the things I would go back to with Julie's kind of one of her first slides, mitigation modeling is not about necessarily the accuracy. It's about learning what's happening in the system and the dynamics of the system. So we're not so concerned about is our parameter value exactly correct. If you're worried about that, then um, trying to estimate your parameters, you probably want to do something a little bit more nuanced. <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you. So is it, uh, Dr. Boata, are you saying it's time for a break? Yeah, if we can uh, have 10 minutes break and then we go back to, so in 10 minutes, we go back with Kaitlin. Okay, is it okay with you? Perfect. So we, we all get a coffee and, you know, we, we go back in 10 minutes. I wish we could be there in person and have some Brazilian Cas coffee. Yeah, and also here, pastel de queijo or... Uh, oh, I miss it. <laughs> or some sucos, juice, okay, fruit juice. Mm. Okay, it's not next time, next time. Okay, yeah. so let's go back in 10 minutes with Katie. Okay. Are you still there, Katie? Yeah. Thank you so much for helping with that question. <laughs> so I, I think we can start for the second part. Caitlin Martinez, please. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Caitlin Martinez. I'm the second part of this mini course. Um, I also am going to be a postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab. And um, now like kind of Julie imitated, I'm gonna be talking really about the forest. So where you got details, I'm gonna gloss over details. <laughs> So a lot of this is because um, we are going to, I'm going to be talking a lot about work that most everyone in this picture has done. It's been a part of, you know, the different people have worked on different aspects of this project. Uh, but because we have such a large team, we can do a lot more work. And so I can talk a lot more about a lot more cool stuff. But it also means I don't necessarily know the intricate details because I didn't necessarily do it. Um, so across the board, a lot of this is going to be credited to a large group of people. So just keep that in mind. Um, and uh, basically, it's a big advertisement for why you should work with other people when you do research, <laughs> because then you can do more really cool stuff. So I'm going to be talking about data fusion in the context of looking at dengue in Brazil. So we're going to get off of the COVID kind of train. Um, not because we're not interested in COVID, but because we actually have a lot more data on dengue in Brazil because it's not new. Um, <laughs> and, and whereas COVID is. And so we can do a lot of really cool stuff on dengue, not only because we want to actually prevent dengue in Brazil and other countries, but we actually have historical information that we can build models off of. Okay. So overall, the team's goal is like a broad, big picture goal is to improve decision support. So what do I mean by decision support? That's um, whoever's making these decisions in your government, in your local public health departments, in your school, your university, you know, people that are making the decision of whether you're remote or not. We want to improve their ability to make decisions by monitoring and forecasting disease outbreaks. And we're going to do this by using a bunch of heterogeneous data, mathematical and computational models. And we also want to really, this is a key point, we want to quantify model uncertainty because um, you've probably seen in the news, either, you know, the US news, I know we had this a lot where, um, well, how do we know if the model's correct, right? And it got it wrong in this amount. Um, so by quantifying model uncertainty, that can really help to say, well, we, there's a 90% chance that we're right. <laughs> and then 
decision support has a little bit more uh, backing to kind of understand that. So our approach, did it switch slides? It's not switching slides, hold on. Hmm, weird. Did, I, did it switch slides for you guys? I don't think it did. I may have to stop screen sharing and try again. Yeah, Just, maybe try to unshare yeah. and reshare. Yeah, we're gonna, exactly. There we go. We may have to do this a couple times, but so our approach kind of gets its uh, inspiration from weather forecasting. So we're all aware of how weather forecasting works. We pull out our phone, we look at the temperature, the forecast to see what we're gonna wear, whether we're gonna bring a sweater, you know, whether we need to bring an umbrella, right? And we're pretty used to it saying, well, there's a 10% chance of rain today. And that means maybe I should have the umbrella in the car, if not on me, <laughs> right? Um, but if it's a 90% chance of rain, you're gonna have the umbrella on you. <laughs> and so we're gonna use kind of this idea because weather forecasters have been doing this forever. They've been using real time um, noisy data, right? Um, to input into models, okay? So this piece right here, mathematical and statistical models, often really complex physical models that are really interesting and really, but they put it into models, okay? And get out forecasts, okay? So that's kind of our goal is we wanna simulate this sort of idea and we wanna combine data-driven and model-driven approaches. So what Julie talked about was mainly a model-driven approach, right? Because she was really coming at it from a, what insights can we gain just from the model, which is really critical. But data allows us to bring that kind of modeling endeavor into the real time, right? And so that, that's kind of what uh, that gives us, okay? So what kind of data are we talking about here, okay? So there's a whole host of data that we collect, that we look for, we scour the internet for, because everyone's collecting data now, okay? So we look at remote sensing data, demographic data, climate and weather stuff, economic indicators. Um, we've seen a lot with COVID that um, the socioeconomic status of someone really is a big driver of whether or not they can socially distance because whether or not they can work from home is a big determiner, you know? Um, we need to find clinical surveillance data. So what I mean by clinical surveillance is like literal case counts. Like, can we actually get the data that tells us what's going on with the epidemic, even if it's not so great data? Okay, infrastructure, um, these are some interesting ones. So news sources and social internet. Um, so the social internet data is a really interesting kind of um, sub piece um, that I'm not gonna talk too much about today because it, um, we don't have nearly as much application in, um, in, in Dengue, but what I mean by social internet, there's two kind of types, okay? So there's information sharing and information seeking sources, okay? So information sharing is like tweeting out that I have a cold, right? <laughs> you know, oh, the, you know, I, I've seen a lot on Twitter lately because of the wildfires in California. Everyone's like, oh, I can't breathe today, you know? Um, and that sort of thing because of the ash and smoke and that's spreading across the US now. So that can be a signal if we're looking at just the air quality kind of thing, maybe a signal we can look for is how many tweets talk about not being able to breathe or leave your home or needing an air purifier, right? But a lot of diseases and many diseases actually are not going to be uh, the type of diseases you're gonna tweet your diagnosis about. So think an STD, right? You're not gonna tweet out that you just got diagnosed with an STD because that's not really information you share, but you are going to seek information on it, right? You're gonna look for symptoms. You're gonna look for treatment. You're gonna um, look for those kind of things. And that's where information seeking is really important. So that's when you're self-diagnosing. You know, we all have become internet doctors these days, right? Where I have a headache, a sore throat, and a blah, right? Now you'll get, you have COVID. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, we're talking about a lot of different data sources. It's often really messy. It's often really kind of crazy. But how can we use all these disparate and dynamic data sources to um, give us some insight into disease spread, okay? Um, and this is any type of disease spread. Uh, we've had teams that have worked on not just dengue, but all, all sorts of different diseases. But we're just gonna talk about dengue. But the big piece of this, and this is probably the biggest um, uh, 
um, lesson I'd want you to take from my talk <laughs> is that data science is a lifestyle, okay? Because whenever you it, add data into your life of whatever you're modeling or looking at, this whole 60% of your time is gonna be cleaning and organizing data, okay? Because it's always messy, it's never in the format you want, <laughs> ever. <laughs> And you often have to um, summarize it, aggregate it, you know, say you get data from a couple of different sources. One of them is you get weekly observations and another one you get monthly observations. How do you use both of those in one model? That's a question you have to answer. And so that's why a lot of your time is gonna be spent organizing data. Whereas the rest of your time is not going to be um, nearly as, um, uh, that's, that's what we, we present on, right? You never present on organizing data, <laughs> right? I mean, I have, but <laughs> um, you, what you present on is usually this kind of piece right here, okay? So just keep that in mind, that all this, a lot of the time is just collecting, organizing, and doing that, that sort of thing, okay? So you guys, if you're in Brazil, are probably much more aware of dengue than I was when I started working on this. I had never even heard of dengue when I started working on dengue. Um, but it's a mosquito-borne tropical disease, okay? And so um, if you've had it, you know that the symptoms include high fever, headache, vomiting, muscle and joint pain, skin rash. For people that are familiar with the flu, that's very overlapping. <laughs> um, and then one of the things that's interesting is that the mortality rates are fairly low. So it's not a high, um, mortality disease, but it's a really high morbidity disease. So what I mean by that is a lot of people get it. <laughs> and so um, over, the WHO estimates of 500 million people are infected with dengue every year, um, which is kind of a crazy number. <laughs> um, and you think about why did this, you know, infectious disease person that was studying um, infectious diseases in Colorado, why wouldn't she have heard of this if 500 million people are being infected? That is a very good question. <laughs> so um, one of the things that makes it hard is the multiple strains makes vaccination and treatment efforts more challenging. And then one of the big things that we as a team are really interested in is how climate change is going to impact the spread of the disease, whether it's going to change the endemic regions, um, because we're talking about um, a, a vector-borne disease, okay? And so what I mean by vector is that it's spread by this stubborn little um, thing. All right, it stopped sharing again. Hold on, we're gonna have to try one more time. Yeah. All, right. All right, so I'm just briefly gonna go through how a vector-borne disease, in particular a mosquito-borne disease, is gonna spread um, in a population, okay? And because for dengue in particular, there's not a whole lot of human to human transmission, okay? So what you need is you need a mosquito, okay, to be infected. Well, they're not gonna be infected yet. They're gonna bite an infectious human, okay? And then they'll become infectious themselves. And then they go and bite a susceptible human or a healthy human, um, denoted by the woman running. <laughs> and then that person will then become infected. And so that's kind of how the process goes, but you don't actually have an interaction like Julie talked about, that mass action interaction between an infectious human and an infe uh, a susceptible human. It all is mediated through this vector for the most part. Um, the other piece of this is that mosquito life cycle has four different stages, okay? We have eggs, larvae, pupae, and then they finally emerge as adult mosquitoes. The thing here is these three stages occur in water, okay? And different mosquitoes like different kinds of water, but they need water to lay their eggs and develop through their adolescent stages, okay? So um, rainfall, humidity, temperature, all these sorts of things become really important when we're talking about the mosquito life cycle, okay? So what do we need to do this modeling? So if we were trying to build a deterministic model like Julie did, Okay, there are ways to build models for vector-borne diseases just like Julie showed us, okay? You just add some more compartments and more populations, okay? We would want um, information about the human-mosquito interactions that spread dengue 
but we also need to know about mosquito abundance and their location, okay? Now you're probably thinking, okay, what is, how do you get that information? Well, you don't, <laughs> is really kind of the, the bottom line. Um, there's not great ways on a big scale to get precise information or even semi-precise information on either of these fronts, okay? Um, there are people that are doing work um, uh, that are doing small studies of mosquito populations and, you know, bringing humans into the lab and having mosquitoes bite them, and which seems insane to me, but not my research, so okay. <laughs> um, so instead, what we, since we can't get this data, especially on a large scale, we're going to turn to proxy data sets, okay? So here's where the data fusion piece comes in, okay? So we're going to fuse proxy data sets that kind of approximate what's going on in either of these two pieces, right? So we're going to take historical clinical surveillance data, so that's disease stuff, satellite imagery, climate data, demographic data, and Google search queries, put them into models, and spit out some sort of risk map, forecast, whatever. Um, what we get out of it really depends on the predictive, the model, right? Um, so we're gonna talk about each of these data sources kind of individually break down what they are. And then um, what's interesting is ultimately our big goal is to get all of these things, put them into one big model and get one big output, okay? But over the course of doing this, because we have so many people working on different teams, we have to get to know the data. And so what we end up having is that out of different parts of the data, you end up learning things just about the data itself and learning something about the system itself from individual pieces of data. So instead of one big model, we might take historical clinical surveillance data and Google search queries and maybe some demographic data and put them into a model and get some input out, right? Um, or output out. <laughs> um, in another case, we might take satellite imagery and climate data and put them into a model and get something out, right? And so you gotta, uh, one of the things we're working on is how do we build up these building blocks so that we can eventually put it all in, right? So I'll talk about different things like that, okay? So historical clinical surveillance data. This is from the Brazilian Ministry of Health. We got some historical data on dengue. Um, cases from 2010 to 2016, I think we're actually getting more than that right now. This is an old slide. Um, but we have this data every week in every single municipality of Brazil at a weekly resolution, which is for a, a, an epidemiologist, a mathematical epidemiologist, you are crying, you're so happy you have this type of data, <laughs> okay? Because it's so rare to have this type of data. Um, typically, if you go look on the WHO, they'll report things at a monthly pace, unless it's an ongoing epidemic. Um, and then they'll also report it due to privacy reasons um, at more of like a, a state level or county level rather than um, a municipality. So it kind of depends on what country you're talking about and what their rules are, but getting this fine resolution is really important. Um, one of the key things is that there's seasonal and regional variation. So I have some um, work done by Lauren Castro in our group where she just looked at the timing of the dengue outbreak every year that we had it, okay? And so she looked at, at what point do we hit 15% of our total cases for that year, okay? So this is kind of like an early warning threshold, right? So we have a peak number of cases. What's 15% of that? And when did we hit that 15%? Like, when did we really start accelerating, okay? And we can see that different parts of the country um, kind of happen at different times, right? So we have this kind of progression where, um, in the north, the very, very north, right, we have um, an earlier peak, right, in October, right, or October, December kind of area. And then as we go forward, the peak happens later into um, February, March kind of time frame. And that's an interesting thing. And that means we can't necessarily just throw one model at every single state. We have to, we have to think about the seasonal and regional variations that are going on here, okay? And this was just done using just the historical clinical surveillance data. But this is useful even on a simple level. So that's an interesting thing, okay? Um, one thing that everyone always talks about, I, forget, I always forget to mention this, 
is there is likely reporting bias. Um, we were talking right before we started this um, broadcast uh, that COVID, you know, how we're reporting COVID is really varied, right? And so um, how, you, how you count a COVID death is kind of a hard question and different states do it differently, different countries do it differently. So um, we are aware in all clinical historical surveillance data, there's gonna be reporting bias on one way or another, but you can't really get any better. <laughs> So that's kind of what we have to we have to work with what we got. Okay, satellite imagery is a really interesting data source. So multispectral imagery gives valuable information about mosquito habitat. So what we're getting here is rather than taking a picture with you know just a normal three color camera, we're taking a picture from satellites um, using um, different levels of. Uh, looking at different levels of light. So we're looking for infrared, near infrared, those kind of wavelengths of light. And it's gonna capture pictures of, with those uh, kind of uh, bands of light. Um, so those wavelengths. And what that gives us is there's actually these really cool ways to take these pictures and see things about vegetation health, water content in leaves. So like literally how healthy vegetation is, water content in bodies, so that's lakes, rivers, ponds, those kind of things. You can look at a burn ratio, so if there's been a wildfire recently, um, and then just on a bare level, is, is it cloudy? And that might indicate moisture in the air and that sort of thing. And so we can get all these five indices um, using, and we can get this near weekly data, okay, from four different satellites that we're able to get some data from. And um, what we can see is that um, initial analysis, oh, I did it again. Sorry, I have to do this every time. I don't know why it's doing it, but that's okay. Um, initial analysis shows that if you look at this um, NDVI kind of curve, um, which is plotted in red here, okay? Um, and then in the background is um, dengue cases, okay? So NDVI, if you notice, is just about vegetation health, like how much vegetation is in the, in the system. Um, and so you can see that there's some level of correlation here, right? I mean, you look at that and you can see a pattern, right? When NDVI goes up, cases go up. It might not be exact, but there's some sort of correlation there. And so we can see that all three of these um, kind of, um, or actually four of these have some sort of relationship with dengue incidents, okay? So similarly, we can get climatological data. So this is temperature um, and humidity um, from weather stations in Brazil. Um, I like to point out, um, this is coming from the NOAA's uh, Global Surface Summary of the Day data set. And one thing I like to point out is the density of weather stations in this region is much different than the density of weather stations in this region, <laughs> okay? And so we have to do some fancy interpolation stuff to make sure we have an observation uh, or an approximate observation in every um, municipality that we have data for, okay? Um, that's, that's doable mathematically, but kind of similarly, we can get kind of this pattern that seems to mirror dengue case counts. Now what's interesting is the amplitude of the temperature doesn't change a whole lot, right? You see that, but the amplitude of the dengue does, okay? And so maybe it's, it's a periodic kind of indicator, but it doesn't actually um, determine the amplitude. Maybe there are other factors that determine the amplitude, okay? One of the um, interesting kind of stories we tell about uh, this data is that there's missing data is really common um, because it's something that is on the ground. It's a ground weather station um, and literally, you know, in the Amazon, a jaguar could come and like destroy it. And then it, we have to take a couple of weeks, have someone come out and fix it, you know, and the data is just gone for that period of time. And so you have to do a lot of different things um, to make this data clean. So we're going back to that 60% of our time is spent doing this kind of stuff, okay? Then we're gonna look at demographic data, okay? And demographic data is something that um, people struggle with because um, I think we're becoming more and more aware that we need to look at it, um, but um, it's kind of a, Maybe it's somewhat political when you kind of start playing in the sandbox of demographic data, okay? So we're, we're actually using the 2010 census that Brazil put out, um, the 
Institute of Geography and Statistics, I think. I, I don't know how to pronounce it in Portuguese, but that's what it is <laughs> in English. Um, and so what we can do is we can take this kind of information and try to glean some information about kind of the mosquito human interactions. Okay. And so one thing I always like to show is you look at this map of rural population, right? Um, percent rural population. And so you see there's high levels of rural population up in here, but you know, different municipalities have different levels and then dengue incidents um, here. Okay. So that's per cases per hundred K. Okay. And there's this inverse relationship, right? Um, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it, there is some sort of relationship here. And so these kind of maps really show us that there is some sort of relationship and we actually can do some simple modeling, just linear models right here, okay? Using um, the demographics to kind of see that um, these kind of population mappers, either rural population, household density, um, education level, uh, poverty, and then percent of uh, population with garbage collection services um, kind of can give us some insight into dengue, uh, yearly dengue burden. And in fact, we actually have found that demographic and, and environmental, you need both of them to really ac accurately capture a uh, yearly dengue burden. Okay, so without, so this is a combination of the demographic data, the climate data, and the satellite data. Okay, so finally, we can get to the Google search queries, okay? Um, and this um, was a project that was done mostly by Daniel Romero Alvarez, where he took the den um, Google search queries as an interesting project where you can kind of pick out different keywords that people are searching for, okay? And you get a daily resolution per state, okay? And through this, we picked out like, I think there was like 30 different keywords that we picked out to just see what was happening, you know, um, all sorts of different things that could be related to get dengue and de the spread of dengue and mosquitoes and those kind of things. But what ended up happening is we identified four keywords most associated with dengue. Okay. So he did all this modeling and all these sorts of things where he built some models and he found that you can build good models with all the, um, all the keywords. But really the four keywords that are really important are dengue, dengue symptomas, um, 80s. So the 80s Egypti mosquito is the one that spreads it and just mosquito. Um, and so what's interesting is you can tell kind of the, the split of it is people are looking for dengue and their symptoms, okay? So maybe they have it or they're worried about having it. And then they're also looking at how to kind of prevent mosquito interactions, right? Um, so, or they're looking at where these mosquitoes live or whatever. Okay, and so one of the things that we can do is you can see in this, this, this is a um, model for all of Brazil. Okay, so this, um, this blue curve is kind of the predictive um, um, model that he built. Um, but it's, um, and you see it's doing really great over all of Brazil. You know, you can see that it's really tracking with the individual case counts, which is awesome. Okay, but when you zoom in and look at this a state by state basis, you actually look it, into it closer, only 12 out of 27 states actually have a uh, accuracy of the model that's uh, sufficient. So an R squared greater than 0.75. And what we ended up finding is that it's not solely, one of our first theories was, is it just that people don't have access to internet? Is that why? Um, and it turns out it's a, it's a combination of different factors where mainly it's a, the source of error when, when, these, um, when it doesn't work in the other 15 states, right? When it doesn't work, it's because of some level of poverty and internet penetration, which means how many people are actually accessing the internet on a consistent basis, okay? Which makes sense. Um, but that's an interesting kind of thing where you kind of have to, all these early sort of, um, how do I put it, all these sort of early sort of exploratory models and kind of digging into the data and understanding it is really important for the eventual models you build because um, you have to know when data is useful. So in this case, we found out, well, the internet data is not always useful. It doesn't always give us better information. And so by doing this, you have to kind of tease out when is it useful, when is it not, okay? And so we're still kind of exploring how to actually apply that to big, big models that we're looking at. Hey, hey to me, did you try with COVID? 
So COVID is starting um, now. On Brazil. On Brazil. So we haven't looked at COVID in Brazil yet, um, but it's one of the goals. Um, I know for sure. Um, part of the issue, and this is this is kind of a nuance of these Google search queries kind of thing, is that when something's a hot button uh, uh, ticket, um, we we have something that is like the Oprah effect. Okay, our, our mentor, Sarah Del Valle, calls it the Oprah effect. So for those of you that are familiar, Oprah's, you know, the celebrity in the US that she'll go on her talk show that she used to have and recommend a book, right? And all of a sudden, everyone's Googling this book and it shoots to the top of the bestseller list just because of how popular she is or the Taylor Swift uh, kind of phenomenon. Taylor Swift tweets out about something, you know? So part of the issue with COVID um, and I anticipate this to be an issue, is that everyone thinks they have COVID right now, <laughs> right? If they have a cough, they could have just a normal cold, they could be out of breath, <laughs> you know, but they're gonna still Google if they have COVID. Um, we saw this happen um, whenever there's an, e an Ebola outbreak in um, Africa, Whenever, literally, it could just be a couple of cases in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It could be the entire outbreak in West Africa that happened in 2014. It doesn't matter how big it is. Every single American, all the English speaking world freaks out and is convinced they have Ebola. <laughs> um, so, but, but maybe selecting a different kind of keywords could be helping more yeah, in the so light like, because people be like smell, losing smell is, is more specific. So yeah, maybe. exactly. And so we have to do some analysis on that to kind of see what is useful. Um, part of our constraints right now is we are, um, and I say we, but it's really we're joining the team that has been um, been on the rapid response. So they've just been trying to get a model live um, and um, helping with decision support for like basic decisions. And now that um, hopefully it's kind of slowing down and we're getting a little bit more room to breathe, we can do more scientific questions. Um, eventually we would want to have kind of a lot of infrastructure in place where we know kind of the things that work and the things that don't. So that when a um, new outbreak happens of a new idea, um, we have like tools in place that we know could work and we test them out really quickly and then go. We're not quite there yet um, in the epi world. Um, and I did just see um, a question in the YouTube chat about how to connect models, uh, models of epidemic spreading to models of the distribution of information and public perception. So we actually just had a meeting. Oh, did I, I moved my audio. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> um, we just had a meeting on COVID about that, and we have a whole team that's working on misinformation, um, how does uh, politics and information distribution and public perception tie into um, the spread of a disease. Um, we're looking, um, a lot of the times we have different models that are looking at those separately, but we are currently trying to merge them. Um, a lot of the times that comes in at how um, like you, Lee, you are to social distance. So you're, the social, the efficacy of social distancing may go down if politically it's not a popular thing. It's kind of a basic answer of that, okay? Um, Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, stop sharing again. What is the deal? Wonder why this is happening, but that's okay. All right, so I'm going to talk briefly about the first way we started building a bigger model, kind of a forecasting model, okay? Um, so we want to predict incidents and risk at various spatial resolutions. That's our big, big picture goal because we have this data at a lot of different spatial resolutions. So, you know, we could end up uh, forecasting at the municipality level. But if you know anything about modeling, anytime you add an extra model or an extra compartment or an extra equation, things just get a little bit more complex and take a little bit more time, <laughs> okay? So when you're building models at this resolution, you need supercomputing power, you need really uh, nuanced kind of things. Um, and so what we ended up starting with um, is we wanted to start at kind of a state level because this is a little bit more, we weren't biting off too much, you know? So we wanted to be able to chew on um, kind of the state level kind of thing. And so for each um, uniform spatiotemporal scale, okay, we want to 
I this might object. First... I might object that. I might object. Oh, totally, totally. I, I, I we talk later, but uh, we'll talk I think, later. I think you have to stay at the municipality at least. So, yeah. if you noticed when we were talking about the demographic modeling, um, the stuff we were did there, um, we were at the municipality level. Okay. Here, because of the complexity of models, we had to kind of scale back to get the entire country of Brazil in one model or one group of models, okay? We're looking at now, okay, now that we kind of understand what's going on, we understand the data, at least on some level, how can we zoom in maybe on just the state of Rio and model just the state of Rio at a municipality level, that sort of thing. The other consideration is um, this first bullet point is really critical. So part of the issue is that um, we don't get the data at the same spatial or temporal resolution, right? So for example, those Google search queries, we get them only at the state level. We don't have information about the municipality level, okay? And so there are ways to build multi-scale models, but we're still figuring those out and how, which ones work for our problems and our questions we're asking. So exactly, I totally get it. Um, we're not there yet. <laughs> Um, and we're getting there. We are getting there. It's just COVID derailed us a little bit. <laughs> um, this, this may be when we can help you. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, for the for the yeah, hopefully. Um, so just kind of to give you a uh, kind of an overall picture of this, we're going to build an independent statistical time series model for each unit of space. So we're going to build one model for each state. Okay, in this, in this instance, okay? And we're gonna look at that independently. This is also a simplifying assumption that probably doesn't work. It may work on the state level, but if we were doing this at the municipality level, there are links between municipality, either by distance or by social networking, right? And so um, part of the reason we're able to make this assumption is because we're working at the state level, <laughs> potentially, okay? So we're gonna try a bunch of different classic time series models, okay, and I say classic because I didn't work on it, a statistician, statistician worked on it, her name is Katherine Kempert, but they're classic, she's told me. Um, and so it's an STL model, so that's an additive model, um, and then SEREMA, and there's three different SEREMA models, and so this is a moving average model that basically takes in the previous, uh, the historical dengue case counts for the last few weeks or the last few months, and then um, the basic one just takes that in and um, spits out what they think dengue case counts are gonna be next week or the next two weeks or the next four weeks, okay? And then you can also, with Serema, you can add exogenous variables. So that's, instead of just looking at dengue case counts, you can add in climatological variables, you know, temperature, humidity, Google search queries, those kind of things, and kind of enhance your ability to predict. Okay, so we built an independent model, all four of these different models, we built one of them for each state, okay? And if you notice, this is a little bit of an overwhelming picture, okay? You look at this and there's a lot of different colors. This is a uh, heat map of error, okay? So the darker the color, the less error, okay? And if you look at this, it's not super clear what the best model is. And it's actually somewhat interesting to, um, um, Overall, this uh, last model is the best, but that's not across the board, okay? So I'm gonna kind of go a little bit quicker through. I have these a little bit out of order, but this is kind of what you get out of it, okay? So the best model, you can pick out the best model and you get forecast trends. So you have in red, it's really, really light here, but in red, you have um, the observed dengue case counts. The blue is our prediction. And part of this is it's, it's predicting like a now casting. So it's filling in the gap that we would get for, uh, it takes a little bit of time to get our clinical surveillance data. Okay, and then we have some prediction intervals. So that's that um, uncertainty level that we're talking about, okay? Um, but when we do this, what we see is that not every state likes extra information, okay? Most of them do, okay? And so on all these error metrics, all of these different states along this kind of range, by adding extra variables, extra information in the form of climate data, Google search queries, weather data, those kind of things, 
we improve our forecasting ability. Our, 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 we do better, okay? We're better at it, okay? But that's not true for all of the states, okay? And actually what's interesting is Rio is one of the states that actually doesn't, at the state level, like extra information. It just likes to know what happened last week with Dengue so I can tell you what happens next week. <laughs> um, and that's just at the state level, okay? At the local level, that may not hold true. And so kind of learning how uh, there's some nuance to it. We're still teasing out. I mean, if you look at this, it's not clear if there's any sp uh, spatial patterning to what helps at all. <laughs> and so we have to kind of figure out what's going on there. Okay. So um, I'm going to kind of uh, roll through this a little bit, but um, the main point is that we have all of this extra information. And on the most, for the most part, having a combination of exogenous variables as well as the clinical surveillance data, it helps us predict risk. Um, we still have to tease out where we're not doing well. Um, there are some areas, especially in the Amazon region, that we're still not accurately predicting things, but we're still kind of teasing out. I mean, this is an ongoing project. We're still working what on it. About, what about the average mobility of people within the region, like so, cellular phones and so on? Yeah, so that's, that's the next stage. Part of it is we have to use what data we have access to, right? And I do know we're starting to get access to cell phone data and bus schedule data and traffic data. Um, but if you notice in my list that we, I went through in detail, we didn't have that on our list, mostly because we just didn't have it. We want it. Um, one of the things when we went down to Brazil last year is we were just uh, talking to anyone and everyone that could give us any data. We're just, we're excited about data here at the lab <laughs> because we can use it. We just need to figure out how. And that's part of the piece of um, what we're interested in is figuring out what data is useful, where and when. Um, and so, um, we want, we're gonna end up extending these. We're looking at uh, collaborations with Ecuador and Colombia and other infectious diseases. We're looking at doing this with COVID. Um, so a lot of these kind of ideas of how do you approach a big data set? How do you approach lots of big data sets? How do you fuse them together? These are all questions we have to address whenever you're gonna do any real-time forecasting with real-time data and that sort of thing. So I kind of ran through the last little bit because I could feel myself talking a little bit too much. Um, but I'm going to leave some time for questions, um, and we can go from there. Thank you, Kathleen, very much. Yeah. I think we have to talk more. <laughs> we do. Yes. So let's see if uh, people can, let's see, uh, one second. I, I, uh, okay, so we have Frederica already asked a lot of questions. Do anyone else has there in the chat, both in uh, YouTube or or in, uh, feel free to ask questions. I think they are intimidated sometimes by, by asking in English. Uh, <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> yes, but the, I'm yes, intimidated so, by asking in Portuguese. So, so I think I think that uh, okay. My general comment is what we were talking before <laughs> the live is that. Uh, uh, in a lot of places, this uh, homogenization, let's say, I don't know if it's the right word now, to, to go from one scale to the other might work. Like, you know, you, you might say, okay, you know, like uh, this work, you know, these are the municipality, then I have drawn out, and then I got an idea about the state, and then so on. So, and for sure, there are some microscopic variables there. But particularly in Rio, because you have so many different kind of situation, you might have big surprise that the local dynamics doesn't follow at all. Yeah, the so states. We, we have know. seen that. One of the yeah. things that we looked at is um, whether or not to use. You notice in the in the forecasting models, um, we only looked at Google search queries, satellite data, and climate data. That yeah. wasn't even all of the data. We left out demographics. Yeah. Um, and I say we, um, uh, our team kind of just because we're, again, we're trying to bite off different pieces of this apple, right? Um, we left out demographics in this case, just because of uh, the time that we were working with and the kind of goals we had for the project. Um, I did a lot of analysis on the demographics and found that really at a local level, the demographics really drive it. 
Yeah. Okay. And did, you, climate, did you take an account of like, you know, for example, in Rio and everywhere else that you have community like favelas, like, yep, you know, they're, totally. they're, you know, breeders, you know, sometimes. So, yeah. Yeah. so in the case of dengue, the COVID was a little bit different, like, we could yeah. have, but in the case of dengue, you know, might be good to look at the distribution you know of these hot spots. yeah so we are we we are looking at that um i think one of the things i'm going to be working on going forward is looking at like the local level um doing some early warning risk maps using um using um demographics and climate indicators um at the local level and trying to kind of tease out those hot spots and those kind of things um julie um helpfully because she's a question asker extraordinaire, um, asked the general question, how does predicting dengue accurately help us fight dengue? That's a super important question. Like, why do we even do this, right? Um, and I think we can, as scientists and mathematical modelers and people that are interested in it, we can sometimes get lost in the just process of doing it. So we have to actually step back and see yeah. why. Actually, actually, I was attending another uh, kind of discourse online, this time from the IPUR uh, uh, Institute that uh, is, uh, is for social sciences. And actually we have a colleague, Tamara Cohen, that is running a very interesting about uh, networks and uh, impact on social science and so on. And, uh, and they were commenting there that uh, is very important to have mediators within the uh, pure community. So I think that if we can join efforts uh, with this mediator, then uh, they even, especially with Dengue, they were reporting that with Dengue, the, uh, the existence of mediator, that they were uh, making the bridge between the scientists outside the community and the population within the community was a crucial step because these people were respected from the local mm -hmm. community. And then the, uh, uh, the message was much more efficient. So maybe we should uh, make a connection with the keep of uh, Tamara Cohen that, you know, she works with this, uh, the, the favela network. She's connected with the favela network, at least in Rio. Yeah. yeah, I think that really addresses one of the key challenges that epidemic modeling, um, that's one way to address one of the key challenges of modeling, which is how do we actually communicate this in a way that not only does the public health department understand, which they might have a little bit of a, uh, not simpler, but they're, they're, they're in the, the field, right? But then how do we even communicate it to the public and have it be trusted by the public um, and, and taken up? So one of the things that by predicting dengue or COVID or any infectious disease, one of the strands that makes this kind of modeling important is that um, we can help decision support. So if we're in collaboration with someone who's making the decision, your government entity, your university president, your whatever, whoever's making a decision about your health and safety, um, and that could end up boiling down to you yourself making your decision about your health and safety, we want to be able to provide accurate, trusted information about what's coming in the future. Okay, and by doing that in a way that is understandable and um, digestible is really important at all levels because not everyone is a mathematical epidemiologist. Um, so that's kind of, I think of it's, it's helping make decisions about health and safety, either at the presidential level or the personal level, right? Okay. You can go. And, and, and can, I, can I ask you, because not only in Brazil, because I imagine even in the States or in Italy, now, even with COVID, and even with people with some level of education, because I've seen sometimes some comment of people that it doesn't, is not strictly related to a, a university degree, a, a certain de degree of uh, barrier. So how do you, do you're dealing this with breaking barriers there in the US during the COVID uh, um, period, you know, like how do you, are you, how you get organized in this and breaking this barrier and get into community that might be resistant mm. to, to kind of awareness, you know, how do, does it work there? Julie, do you have kind of some insight on that? Um, I know you've been working on some level of um, COVID with flannel, kind of live with them a little bit. 
as you've been finishing? Yeah, I think actually this is one of the greatest problems and the greatest challenges because um, how we behave in our everyday lives at an individual level turns out to be really important for um, fighting COVID-19. And um, the individual decisions that people make every day, like, uh, do I believe that a mask makes a difference? Am I going to put my mask on? Or like, uh, do I have other reasons um, why I choose not to wear a mask? I mean, that's, that's just one example of individual behavior on a daily basis. And so um, I don't have a good answer, except that um, it's a huge problem that we need to work on more. And part of it is um, how do we communicate science uh, can we um, interface, uh, like Stefanella was just talking about, like can, can we interface with people in smaller communities, um, like writing pieces in local newspapers, um, attending local meetings, talking with people who are trusted in communities so that we can get the right information to the right people. And I'm just talking because, I mean, I'm like, I can't even begin to address what a difficult challenge this is. Um, because, you know, I mean, it's, it's understandable that a lot of people who, um, maybe don't read national news every day would trust what their neighbor says more than they would trust um, what some scientist on the other side of the country says and that's just human nature so that is something we really need to address but but it seems that globally is and i'm not saying only brazil or only the states even in italy or whatever you see that this is every scale is not just you know it gets at the level of our government, you know, that they don't believe it, that is true. So it, it, I think that uh, what can be our responsibility, because, you know, you can do the other parts, but, you know, we, we are only controlling our part. Really, I think research like you, you are doing, but others maybe not so much, going out, out the ivory tower mm -hmm. and try to bridge I think we have to get into schools and we have to get into elementary schools and, and, and you know, because people have to be educated since the beginning. And to me, there is an, an, an urgency to include whatever, you know, program in the world, some basic, you know, we, what, we, what we teach, what is considered now basic, you know, we, we basic math, literature, history, some science, but why not about human health? I think this is an urgency to include in the program because people then take decision and they have to have their alphabet. As I said, this doesn't depend on the degree because people might have a, a, a PhD in something and the total alphabet about health, you know? So we have to include, it seems to me, this kind of alphabetization. Uh, uh, and, I, I, and I think that in the elementary school, this can even come with a sort of playful within, you know, you can do a first emergency, you know, year uh, training, you know, what about if the grandmother of the kid got an heart attack, what to do? I think that if uh, the kids are more related to action, if you relate this in the elementary school to some program of first aid action and so on, then through the kids, you might get to the parents because kids now uh, from the the bottom to up they might go home and comment this to the parents so i think that we have to start changing the way we see our education program glob uh, on the global level and include include this kind of minimal alphabetization about health I mean, yeah, I agree, Stefanella. And so education is really important. And um, we need to include public health with the basic uh, alphabet of education, like you were saying. And um, I can imagine like a whole bunch of games that could be played that could, you know, where because I think people, children and people naturally want to help the group. Um, and for people to grow up understanding that public health is um, 
for it's a it's a kind of generosity it's a kind of hum, uh, community service where we are helping our friends yeah i've actually done a little bit of work in elementary middle and high school education oh, um uh, my first two years of my phd i was working on in a stem education research group and i built some fun things for like a middle school like a card game for a middle school like kind of learning what epidemics kind of how they spread and that sort of oh, thing that's really great if so, you can share it with us maybe i'll have can. to search it down but yes <laughs> yes maybe we can uh, we can start to nucleate this kind of things because yeah. i think this is uh, uh you know it's hard to from the top to to educate but we can for future we can improve this kind of communication between researcher and the base and we can establish some minimum common language otherwise uh, it, there are a, a parallel universe mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know uh, 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 it's very hard to go on okay so let's see if if there is no more in it from the uh if there is uh yeah so there is some analisa uh pacini is asking I'm starting uh, to start a PhD on climate protection. What, um, what do you think about the mathematical model related to climate changes? Can you quickly make some comments? Yeah, um, I, I did respond in the chat, but I think- ah, I'm sorry. Um, totally fine. Um, <laughs> I, I, could, I wanna add that we are working currently, we just got a um, really awesome project approved at the lab that is all about merging epidemic models and the big climate models that are being built um, at the lab and elsewhere. And so we're working on um, kind of being able to um, tie those two together. Um, I think the mathematical models for climate change are super interesting, super important. Um, I don't know a ton about them. I'm hoping to learn a lot more about them in the next few months. Um, but one of the things that I think is a struggle, kind of like we were just talking about, is communicating their results to people. And I think a lot of what I think about with um, the results, they often linger in those, you know, 100 years out kind of what is going to be going on, right? Like in 100 years, we're in this doomsday scenario, right? And that's really hard for us as humans to connect to. Right. And so as mathematicians and scientists and climate scientists and people that care about this, um, I think we need to bring it results a little closer to home. So that might be looking at modeling wildfires under a climate change scenario for the next 10 years, you know, rather than looking at 100, 200 years down the road. And one of the things that I think was really interesting about our new project at Flannel is by modeling diseases under a climate under climate change scenarios currently. Um, and the trends that we're seeing currently, we can bring it, I mean, health is something so personal to all of us. Um, and so we can bring it a little, not, not to scare people, but make people not just think about the polar bear on the icebergs, but think about their community and their health of their family and their friends. Um, and I, before I forgot, there is a paper by Lucas Tollerman, Pedro Maia, Nathan Kutz, that they study the correlation between the climate data and dengue mm -hmm. in Brazil. Yeah. So yeah, I think I that's know. one of the things that like really jump started our process. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, yeah. that's great. Okay, so thank you so much, and uh, Julie thank and Thank you Katie. for having us. Yes, uh, thank you also Sarah to be always a great unifier and generous. So I really hope we we set up and we talk more even with our, as I said, with Tamara uh, for our, you know, community connection mm -hmm. and, and maybe Guilherme uh, wants to, maybe I'm sure also Guilherme would be interested. Guilherme actually has data, access to data to the local mobility, isn't it true, Guilherme? So maybe can help. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. First of all, thank you so much. Uh, Julian Kepley, I really enjoyed the, the, the explanation and presentation I was following all the time here. And uh, yes, we, we do have data. Uh, we have data regarding the state of Rio de Janeiro, mainly for COVID. And uh, we also have some data regarding mobility, but it is not a fine level grain in, in a sense that we have aggregated data, okay? 
but uh, it's quite it's quite interesting because we can have it regarding the states and also regarding the the cities. Yeah. So it's it's possible to see it. Uh, there, there are, yes. So we, that's something that we can uh, uh, do. And, and, and I enjoyed also the, the, the question regarding the climate change and everything, so the COVID, because climate change, it's something that we discuss a lot at the, at the university. So we have uh, a lot of people working on that, uh, the green stuff and then everything, the different uh, uh, departments that I work with. And this combination of uh, issues is part of a big project that we have now that Stefanel is part of this project too, so yeah. that's that's why she is smiling right now. <laughs> but uh, it, it's something that uh, we can really explore with the supercomputers and everything. So uh, that's why I'm saying that uh, I, I see a, a really, uh, it's likely that we are going to work a lot together. Yeah. So it's it could be really nice. And, and thank you so much again for, for sharing all this knowledge with us that was really amazing the presentation was wonderful very well, wonderful thank you thank you so much okay so future we establish some year okay. we we will we make an appointment in the next two weeks we make sure yeah. we have it right away okay Perfect. so thank you and thank you. Uh, hopefully see you soon very, to future collaboration absolutely Bye-bye. Thank you so bye much. Bye-bye. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Stefanella. Congrats. <laughs> Nothing. Bye-bye.